Welcome back to the next video, everybody. Today, we're going to be looking at a collection of local Galois deformation conditions. So we're going to be taking the information from the previous few videos, and we'll be looking at some specific helpful concrete cases of it for the proof of Fermat's last theorem. We'll let k sub lambda be a local field of characteristic L. We'll describe some useful local deformation conditions d sub lambda. Okay, so for each of these conditions, we'll, we'll have to check that they are indeed actually deformation conditions in the technical sense described earlier in this chapter, chapter eight in this playlist. And we'll also then have to describe the sub A modules, H1D lambda, GK lambda, and AV inside the full H1, GK lambda, and AV. Okay, so we'll specifically study minimal ramification conditions for primes P that aren't L in degree two in this video. And the next video, we'll look at some other conditions like ordinariness and flatness. Okay, so the setup is simple. Rho bar from GK lambda to GL2 of K will be or some residual representation where K is a finite field of characteristic P that is an L. We're gonna suppose that one of the two following minimal ramification conditions hold. The first condition will be called condition A, and it will say that the image of the inertia subgroup I in GK lambda under rho bar is non-trivial. And it's contained in a subgroup of GL2K, which is conjugate to basically unipotent matrices. So one star, zero, one. So we sort of have a, have a minimal ramification condition here, right? Like if we had total unramification, there would be a zero here. And so we're sort of, min we're allowing a minimal ramification in some sense by allowing this upper entry to vary, okay? And so to make that more precise, we'll say that a deformation row of row bar to a coefficient ring A with residue field K is minimally ramified. If the image under row of I is contained in a subgroup of GL2 of A conjugate also to this kind of unipotent matrix group one star zero one. Okay, but there's another way you can sort of allow minimal ramification in some sense. We'll call that condition B. And that's that the image of I under row bar is non-trivial and is contained in a subgroup of GL2 of K conjugate now to star zero, zero, one. So again, if we had no ramification, this would be a one, right? Usually this will be some character like the cyclotomic character or something like that. In this case, we'll say that def a deformation row of row bar to a coefficient ring A is minimally ramified. If the image under rho of i is finite and of order prime to p, or equivalently, if rho of i is finite and has the same order as rho bar of i. So are these deformation conditions? Uh, these are useful conditions to put on deformations that we'll have to consider for the proof of Fermat's last theorem. So it'd be nice that they were actually deformation conditions. So we could look at uh, quotients of the overall universal deformation ring corresponding to these conditions. So that, and so that we could also look cohomologically at the tangent space and things like that. So proposition 28, fix a coefficient ring lambda with residue field K, a finite field of characteristic P, which isn't L. For any coefficient lambda algebra A, let D be the condition on a representation rho from GK lambda to GL2 of A, that it's associated residual representation rho bar from GK lambda to GL2 of K is minimally ramified in one of the two senses A or B above. And that rho itself is correspondingly minimally ramified in the same way. Then D is a deformation condition, thank goodness. And the sub A module H1 sub D of GK lambda and AV uh, sitting inside the full H1 of GK lambda and AV corresponding to the deformation ring that we'll have in this sense if we have absolute irreducibility, for example, is none other than H1 of G sub little k sub lambda of and AV to the I inside the full H1 of GK lambda and AV. So what is little k lambda here? It's just the residue field of big k lambda. And what does it mean to take and AV to the I the superscript I just denotes the sub A module of elements fixed by inertia, okay? And then this inclusion is the natural one coming from like basic algebraic number theory, okay? For a proof of this, you can see CSS page 301. Perfect. So next video, we'll start looking at some other deformation conditions that we'll have to, to be aware of, which would be ordinariness and flatness. And so I'll see you then, and thanks for watching.